Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Bade Fatunde. I'm a second year uh, fellow at, at Mayo Clinic Arizona. Uh, I'm also one of the AHA uh, fellow and training bloggers. Uh, I have the pleasure of, uh, of being joined by the one and only Dr. Rod Tung. Uh, he is currently in a vehicle, so that's not a Zoom background, uh, but we have been at HRS 2022 this past weekend and uh, looking forward to uh, uh, great discussion topics. Um, so we'll go ahead and dive right in. Uh, so uh, Dr. Tung, um, uh, you, uh, there was recently a paper um, uh, that you were on talking about uh, capture selectivity of, um, of uh, left bundle pacing uh, in, uh, in a variety of patients. And so um, would you just be able to give just a little bit of background to that paper? Sure. Well, thanks, Bade, for having me on your on your vlog, and uh, it's appreciated. And I'm sorry for the movement in the back. We had a great heart rhythm in 2022, and left bundle pacing is all the rage. Yeah. For those cardiologists that don't know about it, it's really just fixing the lead a little deeper into the septum and trying to get closer access to the conduction system. And sometimes when the lead's a little bit deeper, you actually capture the left conduction system, which is quite beautiful. And we all know that his Purkinje system is so specialized that to be able to preserve the recruitment of it may reduce heart failure by reducing dyssynchrony. So it's really important. And the, in the paper that we published more recently, which Jackie P, trying to describe what the EKG characteristics of left bundle branch area pacing are. And the point is, is that if you capture the left bundle, you should probably get a right bundle branch block morphology. And it doesn't make sense that you would expect it to be narrow. And that's what we see in his bundle pacing because you're at the top of the wishbone. So the idea is if you capture the left bundle, you'll still get something to synchronous because it'll be a right bundle pattern, but you'll pre-excite the left ventricle. So what we were trying to study was what are the things that affect the left bundle QRS characteristics during pacing? And in general, they should be wider than his bundle pacing, number one. Number two, if you are able to fuse it with the intrinsic right bundle activation of your normal conduction, because these aren't always heart block patients, that's the reason why it starts looking more narrow. But nevertheless, we do think that if you pace a little bit more distally, you might shorten some of the activation time because it's quicker to get out of the system. And then the other message that we found was that in patients that have left bundle branch block, their QRSs are longer and wider in duration than the others have narrow QRS. And the reason that is, is because the bundle is blocked retrogradely as well. So if you you got to go up over to this, come back down the right bundle. And in this situation, if it's blocked, it's going to take longer to do that. And you're going to have delayed right bundle synchronization. So a lot of EP esoterica, but it's relevant in terms of how we give classification to left bundle area patients. Yeah. And, um, you know, trying to find the best method of physiologic pacing has been, you know, you know, the holy grail, um, you know, his bundle pacing, um, you know, some, some criticisms of that is just that you have high capture thresholds and, um, and uh, which will, will eventually lead to, to battery drainage. Um, and then also like procedural characteristics. Um, um, do you think that um, with as we discover more of, about left bundle pacing, they'll be applicable to a wider, um, a wider cadre of patients? Absolutely. Yes. I think I that think left bundle area pacing is probably easier because the region that you're targeting is larger than just the little, yeah. you know, the pin on the needle. So it probably is more relevant. And sometimes patients might get left bundle branch block, but it's very proximal. And then you can be leaving the his pacing. But if the the pathology is actually distal, then you actually need to pace a little bit more distally, which is what left bundle area pacing can be. So there's just a recent randomized trial with Heart Rhythm Society called Left Bundle Resync, and it just showed that with 20 versus 20, it was superior to standard CRT and not really interesting. Yes, so it, it's definitely ex exciting advancement. It should be, um, it should be uh, great to see the, uh, the distal trials that come. Um, was there anything about y'all's study that that surprised you? Um, well, in the in this QRS uh, characteristics yeah. study, um, probably that if you pace a little bit more distally, which some people are doing in the fascicle, you can shorten something called LVAT, the LVAT, yeah. mm. and that be it's because you get out of the conduction system faster, and it seems like you've got better, but maybe fascicular is worse because the QRS gets wider. 
because yeah. you've got to loop all the way around. Yeah. Um, one thing I noticed that um, about 65, per, so a majority um, of patients um, in, in, uh, in this study were NYHA class one or two. And um, do you think that uh, the same results would um, apply to, let's say, in NYHA uh, class three or four patients? Uh, hard to know. I think that we have to do the clinical studies when we talk about the clinical outcomes. So we don't know yet. All right. All right. Um, well, that was a, a whirlwind um, a review of the uh, capture selectivity and left one branch pacing. Uh, now I wanted to ask Dr. Uh, Tung uh, a bit about what he thought about some of the uh, the trials on um, or the discussions that we had on on VT. Um, I, I did. I was fortunate enough to sit in a um, endpoints for VT ablation uh, talk, and where they talked about using bolted mapping and, and non inducibility. Um, so, what were the trials at HRS 2022 that that you saw that caught your eye? Um, and um, that, that you think have a lot of promise? Well, I think in the VT world, we didn't really have any big, big randomized trials. We had some some stuff on PFA, yeah. where in the ventricle and preclinical cool. model, you know, you may need contact, which is important that people need to understand it before we just say, this is the savior. Um, we had Survive VT and Partita that came out at AHA, I mean, Circulation, um, and Jack just recently which are two randomized trials in VT showing that VT ablation earlier decreases VT recurrence and mortality in two separate studies, but sometimes not both in the same study. So it is interesting and refining patient selection is still really critical. And then we just had an epicardial session from the Brazil yeah. uh, Congress and showed and talked a lot about epicardial ablation when it's needed. And obviously in Brugada and ARVC and non-ischemics, that's where it's most useful. Yeah. Um, I, I sat in on a session where they talked about different methods of epicardial access, whether using the needle and needle technique. Um, and then there was um, one physician that talked about uh, using um, uh, basically using CO2 insufflation. Um, mm -hmm. so, um, Making it, access uh, safer. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Um, so it should be uh, interesting to see what proportion of patients are. Um, are able to get uh, epicardial access without actually having a, a full sternotomy. Um, mm -hmm. uh, moving forward, moving forward. Um, so just to round up, uh, what you're you're a well-established uh, uh, professor now. What advice would you give to yourself uh, uh, way back when as a fellow? What advice do you have for fellows in training? And it's perfect timing because I just got to the airport, so we'll. We'll leave it as a couple of take home points. Number one, stay curious, yep. always question the status quo and try to find disease entities that you really are fascinated by physiologically where there's a void of understanding. Yep. Find an area and you say, you know what, maybe we don't know what need, we need to do with sudden death and HOCA. Maybe we don't know what to do with persistent AF and heart failure. Maybe we don't know what to do with someone with CPVT. Find something that you love and then look into it, read about it, and figure out where the void is. And that's where you can, might have the opportunity to fill in. Stay curious and read a ton. Now you have all these digital resources, and there's no excuse not to stay in, in touch with the data. And academic medicine is kind of endangered, if not extinct. Academics is kind of what's in here these days. It's something that you do because you're passionate about it. And you don't have to be in an academic system to do clinical research or to be curious. So those would be my last words as we're pulling up to SFO. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Tung, for your time. Have a safe trip back to Phoenix and, and, um, and looking forward to talking with you later. Awesome. Thank you, buddy. Congrats. All right. Thank you.